Hey, pastors, we know you love your clerical shirt because of what it means, but how does it feel? Under all those vestments, is it hot and sticky? Is it too tight, too loose, or just not comfortable? Wicking Vicar has the solution for you. The Performance Clerical Shirt, featuring four-way stretch to let you move and moisture-wicking fabric to keep you cool. Plus, it's machine washable and wrinkle-resistant. Visit wickingvicar.com and treat yourself to more stretch, more movement, and easy care. The Performance Clerical from wickingvicar.com. Wickingvicar.com. Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is, the mind of Christ, and to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we're going to consider why Concord matters for stewardship. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point and St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. And my companion confessor in conversation about this matter today is Pastor Heath Curtis. He is pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Warden, Illinois, and Zion Lutheran Church in Carpenter, Illinois. He also serves as coordinator for stewardship for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And also notable for our conversation today, he is co-author of the book Stewardship for the Care of Souls. Pastor Curtis, welcome to Concord Matters. Hey, great to be with you, Sean. Yeah, it's absolutely an honor to have you on today and to talk about stewardship. Obviously, as noted in the introduction there, you've co-authored a book on this. You serve as coordinator for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod on this. Let's go ahead and get into it then and ask kind of an obvious first question. What is stewardship? What do we mean by that? I mean, we often generally think we have an idea of what we mean by that, especially in the church. Uh, Sometimes you'll hear things like time, talents, and treasures referenced. Wonder your thoughts on if that's a helpful way to think about stewardship or what's a way for us to think about stewardship. Go ahead and get us into it with that. Sure. Well, you know, I don't think it helps anybody to beat around the bush. When churches talk about stewardship, they're talking about the financial support of the church that Christians give to their local congregation and then to the larger entities in the church. Because it's the churches, of course, local congregations who then gather together to do work together, whether that's you know, educating church workers, doing missionary work around the world, helping one another out in many different ways. So, you know, in churchly talk, everybody knows what we're talking about when we're talking about stewardship. We're talking about the generosity that individual Christians give to their congregations. Now, where we hurt ourselves in this is if we don't locate this within our theology. This is why people get uncomfortable when we talk about stewardship in the church, because they know we're talking about money. And I mean, sometimes I, you know, I don't want to put it in too bad of a light, but you know, you mentioned time, talent, treasures. Sometimes I'll kind of poke a little bit of fun at that. I mean, obviously you're a fan of alliteration and that alliteration, I think only works in English, right? Time, talent, and treasures. So I doubt that was kind of a biblical topic. And so I suspect that whoever invented the phrase time, talent, treasures was an English speaking Christian who was just kind of uncomfortable talking about the treasure part. And he's like, well, what else do we steward? And that goes to the fact that we're often uncomfortable talking about money in church, talking about stewardship, talking about the giving that Christians give in church for the conduct of the ministry. And often when I'm out doing workshops, which is one of the big things that I do for the Office of National Mission within the Missouri Synod, as coordinator for stewardship, I go out at the, especially at the circuit level, also the district level, the regional level, and I'll speak to groups of pastors and lay leaders about stewardship, about how this works in the life of the congregation, about the theology of stewardship and so forth. And one of the questions I will often start with is, you know, I'll separate out. So first I want to hear just from the lay people. Why don't you like a stewardship sermon? 
What makes you nervous about, you know, talking about how we need to have a stewardship program in our congregation this year? And, you know, people have a lot of things to say, you know, just kind of middle American reluctance to talk about money and finances at all. Uh, other people say, well, you know, it just, it makes people uncomfortable, perhaps especially visitors to the church. Um, someone has probably heard some unbeliever talk about how all oh, those Christians, they just want your money. Religion in general is just a scam to get your money. And, you know, let the lay people talk for a while. And then I'll ask, okay, preachers, what about you? So I'll, I'll ask, I'll interview you, Pastor Smith. What makes you nervous? How would you feel if your elders came up and said, hey, pastor, we, we really need to do a stewardship thing this year? Well, that's where it does get uncomfortable for me because, as you say, you know, folks really push back against that. And mm -hmm. I, I was raised with the mentality of, you know, that that's just the business side of the church. That's for yeah, the right. council to worry about and things. Yeah, and, right. So, uh, so, so pastor might say, I'm not an expert on this. I, I'm not a finance guy. I'm not a money guy. I'm a theology and pastoral care guy. That, that might be one thing. And if, you know, we get a room of pastors together and we keep prodding this, I can usually get somebody to say, you know, another thing that really makes it nerve wracking for me as the preacher to talk about this is because on Sunday morning, when the plate is passed, I mean, everybody knows that when it goes by my wife, in essence, she reaches in and takes a bunch of money out of the plate, right? I mean, everybody knows that my livelihood comes from the passing of the plate. So how does this not look anything but self-serving if I spend some time talking about the duty of a Christian to financially support the work of the church? So stewardship, the call from God for Christians to be faithful and generous in supporting the work of the ministry, tends to make everybody, laity and pastors in the church, tends to make us all nervous, tends to make us uncomfortable. So a big part of what we do with our resources and with our training workshops is pointing out that the only way this discomfort is going to go away, the only way we're going to become comfortable and find our footing in talking about stewardship is if we in fact locate this within our theology. Because you're right, you know, your initial response of, I mean, is this even my job? Well, what do I have to do with this as a pastor? Isn't this the business end? of the church's work, which I don't particularly feel qualified as the preacher to take on, that's a good instinct. You know, the preacher should be sure that whatever he's talking about, he can talk about it as something that's rooted in the word of God and is part of his job. So when we begin to think about, so where does stewardship fit? Well, you tell me, I'll, I'll interview you again. Is this law or gospel? Or where does this fit? I think most often we tend to think about it as law, right? God just says, give, well, in the Old Testament, 10% mm -hmm. and, you know, just sure. give money. Yeah, sounds good to me. And again, I, I don't think it behooves us to beat around the bush. And it, we have this tendency as Lutherans to slip into a bad habit of thought, more than a habit of thought, just a reflex, that gospel, good, law, bad. But of course, that's not true. And we know in our heart of hearts, it's not true. We know that within the article of justification, the law can't save me and that the law is always going to make me feel badly if I look at it within the article of justification, because I, as St. Paul says in Romans three, no one is going to be justified in God's sight by works of the law. Okay. The law reveals our sin. The law works wrath. Okay. But does that mean somehow that, you know, the sixth commandment is bad? Does it somehow mean that when God says, don't commit adultery, he's trying to ruin your day? Well, no, the law of God is good and wise. When God is telling you in the sixth commandment, don't commit adultery, he's telling you that marriage should be honored and that furthermore, that's going to make you happier than the alternative. About the seventh commandment, no matter how tempted you might be to make an easy dollar by cheating or stealing. In the long run, it's not going to make you happy. And so the, the commandments are there not to make us sad. The commandments are there to bless us. Now, unfortunately, due to our sin, the commandments are always going to reveal something sinful in us. 
But we should remember that the law is there to bless us. I mean, just before I came over, you know, I'm one of the few people on the planet, you know, country pastors, some of the last people with landlines. And so I still get scammer calls on the landline. And just before I came over here, I put it on speakerphone for the kids. And, you know, it's the lamest, most low effort scammer call in the world trying to tell me that I had won Publishers Clearinghouse. And I string them along for a little while for laughs for the kids. But then I actually just did tell the guy, you know, you need to repent. You know, you're just sinning. You're preying on lonely, sad people who need money. And you are just, you are a jerk. You need to repent. And I hope he does. And I, I hope he goes on to live a godly Christian life. But the point is, he's facing a temptation. And it's not that the, the, the law is bad. It's not that the seventh commandment is bad. It's that in his sinfulness, it should be making him feel bad, but the law should be seen as a gift from God. I mean, the Christian view of the law as renewed people in Christ, our view of the law changes from a mere unbeliever. It's not merely condemnatory. Rather, the law also demonstrates to us, hey, this is how God seeks to bless you. And so we can, you can look at every one of the commandments as actually protecting one of the blessings that God has given us. So the sixth commandment and the fourth commandment both protect marriage and family. Seventh commandment protects civil society and the ability for people to go out and make a living and be a productive member of society. The eighth commandment protects your reputation and, and our ability again, to live together as people who love and honor each other. So each one of the commandments is blessing us. And so you mentioned the commandments in the Old Testament law, and you mentioned the tithe. So again, I'll, I'll ask you, what blessing was that law in the Old Testament protecting? What, why did that law exist? What was the point of it? The provision for the Levites to minister in the tabernacle and temple later, and then providing also for the people of the land. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So. That law in the Old Testament, hey, everybody needs to give a tenth of their income. That was not there to make the people feel bad. It was not there to curse them in some way. Rather, that was so that the Levites could earn a living. And, you know, well, why does the Levites get it and nobody else? Well, because all the other tribes, every member of every other tribe, received a plot of lamb to a farm and to ranch. And that's how they made their living. But God had commanded that there be a full-time ministry in the Old Testament. He had commanded that this whole tribe, the Levites, would be dedicated to the ministry of God, teaching the people, conducting worship, conducting the sacrifices in the temple that pointed forward, of course, to Christ and his ultimate sacrifice for us. And so the purpose of that law of, of tithing in the Old Testament, stewardship in the Old Testament, was for the maintenance of a full-time ministry. And so this is how, this is one of the ways that we begin to talk about stewardship now in the New Testament. Because when we look at laws in the Old Testament and we shift them over to the New Testament, St. Paul has a very helpful rubric for helping us understand what comes over from the Old Testament and what doesn't come over, or really just the way to say how the law comes over from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And, and that paradigm he uses is letter and spirit. So Paul says, right, you know, the letter of the law, that doesn't come over to the New Testament. So in Colossians chapter 2, St. Paul says, don't let anybody judge you in regard to a Sabbath or a new moon or a festival. Right? He says, that Old Testament calendar for worship, the jot and tittle of those laws, those are the shadow. He calls them the shadow. And the substance, the thing that actually casts the shadow, is Christ. And he says, well, now we have Christ. So those Old Testament laws that dealt with pointing forward to Christ, Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, you know, nobody can judge you in regard to those. But what do you remember from the book of Acts? When did the church meet for worship? Well, they moved from the Sabbath to the day of resurrection, so they met every week on Sunday. So they still met every week. Interesting. So even though, you know, there's no, you can't find a verse in the New Testament 
that says, hey, all y'all get to church every Sunday. And yet, right? And yet, that's exactly what the apostles did. And in fact, I just think it's inconceivable to think that, you know, Peter and Paul would have got together with the rest of the apostles and said, well, guys, how often should we get together for worship? What do you say? You want to get together on the, uh, I don't know, the third Wednesday of each month? And, you know, St. James says, well, you know, let's do like the first and third Wednesdays of each month. And then they vote on that. And okay, we're going to have free of church twice a month. That's inconceivable because in the Old Testament, the church met on a weekly basis. And so that's the letter of the law. But what was the spirit of that law? What, what was the point of the Sabbath? It was for a holy convocation to the Lord. It was so that people would have the time in their life to worship God and to receive the blessings that God gives at his worship service. So just as it's inconceivable that the church would be doing less than the Old Testament church did in regard to the Sabbath, you know, we can do the same kind of analysis for when it comes to the tithe. What was the spirit of the law when it came to the tithe, the purpose of the law? That was so that there might be a full-time ministry. Well, what do we find in the New Testament? St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, the Lord has ordained that those who preach the gospel should make their living from the gospel. So in the New Testament as well, there is a command that there be a full-time ministry. It's different from the Levites in many ways. It's not hereditary. Rather, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1, St. Paul lays out, you know, here are the qualifications for a preacher. This is what we want in a preacher. But what remains is that there be a full-time ministry, that those who preach the gospel should make their living from the gospel. And so, you know, laying this out in front of people in a workshop, we'll say, well, what do you think? Is the work of the New Testament church easier, lesser than the Old Testament church? The work of the New Testament church, I mean, it's just, it's not even, it, it's several orders of magnitude bigger than the job of the church in the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, there was one church. You mentioned there at one time there was the tabernacle and then there was the temple. The Old Testament church, its job was to stay cohesive and to keep existing until Christ could be born in Bethlehem. They weren't sending out missionaries. Now, every once in a while, God will decide to send Jonah to Nineveh, but you notice Nineveh is surprised at this. This is not the normal thing in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, they're called upon to stay separate from Gentiles. Now, if the Queen of Sheba hears about it, that's fine. We'll, we'll welcome her. We'll welcome people who come and want to worship in the court of the Gentiles. But now in the New Testament, all of a sudden it's go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them and teaching them. So the full-time work of the ministry in the New Testament is simply larger in every way than the full-time ministry in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, what it took to support that, what made for a generous living was a tithe. It's hard for me to imagine that when St. Paul says that Christians should excel in the generosity, that he would be thinking anything less than the Old Testament tithe. It's just, just inconceivable. And again, the only time that Jesus mentions the tithe in the New Testament is in Matthew 23 when he's castigating the Pharisees and he says to them, you tithe down to the mint and cumin in your spice cabinet, right? And the next thing out of Jesus' mouth is, and well you should, but without neglecting the weightier matters of the law. So when Jesus talks about the tithe, he says, yeah, sure, that's a good thing to do. And not only that, it's an easy thing to do. It's not a weighty matter. It's a light matter. It's actually easy to do. So this is how we begin to approach stewardship from a theological perspective. This is not just, oh, okay, we're, we're behind in the budget. Let's throw out uh, you know, a bulletin announcement here around Thanksgiving, around Christmas time try to get people, you know, we got to pay the bills. Uh, recently visited a church where they had a little, you know, announcement afterward about this. And, and I mean, it, it's good 
that this congregation has really open finances, that the people of the congregation know what's going on. That's absolutely appropriate. But it, we're missing a little bit of theology if our call for the people to be generous is, hey, guys, we're behind on the bills. Let's make sure we give to cover the bills. That's why people don't like stewardship, because that connection to the theology is lost. So placing stewardship where it belongs within our theology, okay, it's the law. And okay, now we understand the reason for this law. We understand the spirit of this law. We can support a full-time ministry. But there's more. There's more to say. There's more to plug this into our theology because, again, I'll ask you, when it comes to getting people, encouraging people to keep the law, that's, I already mentioned, that's not within the article of justification. Where is that? If that's not the, uh, if that's not the header that, hey, I exhort you to keep the law of God. If that's not under justification, what heading is it under? Well, sanctification, right? Okay, sanctification. Okay, so again, we can begin to hang this you know, place this within the taxonomy of our theology. Okay. So stewardship is going to be a part of my sanctification, a part of my growing in Christ. This opens up another aspect that especially Lutherans, I think, do very well in comparison to other confessions of the faith, because it's often within the article of sanctification. That's the area where you can really see where other confessions have gone haywire. So how would you say, what's wrong with the Roman Catholic approach to sanctification? Well, that they mingle justification with sanctification, that the works would save them and that it makes them more worthy to God and uh, things like that. Right, exactly. So, so they, they have a confusion of justification and sanctification, and that messes everything up. Then the law of God can become a way for me to, you know, kind of uh, get God to owe me. And in its most crass form, you know, if you've got an old Roman Catholic missile, you know, you can open up to the back and they'll even list, right? How many days and years you can get off of purgatory for this good work or that good work. Uh, when John Paul II put out his big uh, millennium indulgence in the year 2000, it was kind of a buy one, get one deal. And it was, if you did some good work, every day you did the good work, um, you could get, you know, a, a relative or whomever you designated a day off of purgatory. Well, boy, there's no clearer confusion between justification and sanctification. And up and down the piety of Roman Catholicism, that confusion, that mistake within the article of sanctification just runs up and down all their piety. We look at charismatics and again, what they ask the question, okay, how do I get sanctified? How do I get holy? Well, I probably need to have the Holy spirit, but how do I know if I have the Holy spirit? Well, I'm going to seek, you know, the gift of tongues. I'm going to seek the gift of interpretation. And so their whole theology becomes, you know, goes off in an unhelpful direction because they misunderstand how sanctification works and they chase holiness in a way that, uh, you know, in the kind of the proto charismatics in Luther's day, of course, Luther famously said they they've swallowed the Holy ghost feathers and all, but this is an area where Lutherans, where we should be very comfortable talking about sanctification because we have a very good way to talk about it, to think about it, to bring it into our preaching and our teaching. And that is we do sanctification through the doctrine of vocation. So vocation is just the Latin word for calling, that God has called me to various positions in life. And Luther is, uh, and, and he's not the only teacher of the church, it, it was you know, popular before him, but he liked to talk about, you know, there are three spheres of life in which God has given you a calling. So God has called you in the home. He's called you to be a husband and father, a wife and mother, all those family relationships, all the dynamics of the home, and that that is a good calling from God. It is a holy 
calling from God. So for Lutherans, there's not a distinction in the life of the Christian between secular and religious. My entire life is baptized. I'm baptized and called to holiness within my home and also within the church and also in my life out in the world. So home, church, and society, these three areas of life, in each one of those, I have a holy calling from God. So within the home, for example, so I serve as a husband and a father, and that's a calling from God. I don't get to quit that. I don't get to walk away from that. Why? Well, because I made, I made a promise. Uh, well, uh, sure. But first and foremost, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Not based on my vow, my marriage vow. My calling is not based on my marriage vow, but it's, it's based on God's call. God has put me in this position. Uh, God doesn't give everybody a spouse. God doesn't give every husband and wife children. But everybody has a calling in the home because everybody's born into that relationship. Everybody's born into this hierarchy within the home. The other, the term actually that Luther prefers for these spheres of life is hierarchy. So the hierarchy of the home of the church and of society. So everybody's a son or a daughter. Everybody's born into a relationship. Everybody's born with a calling. They can't quit, at least not without sin, right? Because God is doing the calling. So there's no time limit on this calling and you don't get to quit and you're born into this relationship and it's a gift. And so on the other side of the break, we can talk about what it means to have a calling in home, church, and world, and how then stewardship actually, this is really where we're going to peg stewardship as part of the article of sanctification through our vocations in home, church, and society. That's an excellent setup there for us. So that is what we will pick up on the other side of the break as we continue talking about why Concord matters for stewardship with Pastor Heath Curtis. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, and you're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO. The word of Christ comes forth from his mouth as a sharp, two-edged sword. By that word, he puts our sin to death, and he raises us to new life in him. Join me, Pastor Timothy Apple, on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on KFUO, as guest pastors from around the world lead us into the word of God to help us sharpen our faith in Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. to Concord Matters as we continue talking about why Concord Matters for Stewardship with Pastor Heath Curtis, who is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Warden, Illinois, and Zion Lutheran Church in Carpenter, Illinois. He also serves as coordinator for stewardship for the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, and also he is co-author of the book Stewardship for the Care of Souls. And Pastor Curtis, just before the break there, you were setting up for us how we can look at stewardship in terms of our Christian vocation, that great teaching that we Lutherans rightly ground in talking about our Christian life and sanctification. And you were laying out for us how we look at stewardship in the home, church, and in society. So go ahead and continue talking about that for us here. Right. So you have a holy calling in each of these three places within your home, within the church, and within society. This calling is from God. And you should view it as your religious life, your religious life in home, church, and society. You, as an entire person, have been baptized, and your entire person has been called by God, but in specific ways. So again, in the home, I'm called to be a husband or a father, but even if God had not called me to be a husband or a father, I'd still be a son. I would still be born into this hierarchy. I'd have duties and responsibilities. Likewise, in the church, I'm a preacher, but not everybody's called to be a preacher. Uh, My wife is a Sunday school teacher, but not everybody is going to be a Sunday school teacher. My daughter's an organist. Not everybody could play the organ. 
Uh, the boys do a little acolyting. Not everybody's going to acolyte. But no matter what the thing you do in church, the role you fill within church, also in the church, you have that vocation you can't not have. So in the home, you can't not be a son or a daughter. Everybody's born into a family. Everybody's born into that hierarchy within the home. Likewise, in the church, you can't not be a son or daughter of your heavenly father. You are a Christian. You are a co-heir with Christ. You are his brother and friend. No matter what other gifts God has given you or has not given you, you're going to have that vocation as a son or daughter of the Heavenly Father, as a Christian. And then in society, when the Bible talks about us and other people in society, it actually doesn't use the term son or daughter, brother or sister. Then we begin hearing the term neighbor, right? You should not covet your neighbor's wife. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus was once asked what it means to be a neighbor, and he explained the term. The term neighbor in English and Latin and Greek and Hebrew all means the same thing. It means the person next to you. It means the person that God has placed near you. So the English word neighbor literally means the near farmer, the guy next door to you, the guy you share a fence with. That's your neighbor. So when Jesus told the story of, about neighborliness, right? A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers. They beat him, robbed him, left him half dead. A priest and a Levite come by. God has put this guy in their path, and they unneighbor him. They cross the street. They go away from him. They put distance between themselves and him. Whereas the Samaritan comes down, and he draws near. He acts as a neighbor to him. So first off, in each of these places, in home, in church, in society, I will always have a vocation. No matter what else is going on, I'm always going to have a connection to home, church, and society. And it pays to know what each of those vocations is for each one of us, and we can all you know, think through what those are. And it's also helpful to think about how different it is within home and church as opposed to my vocations out in the world. So within home and church, I'm a son or a daughter. The church is a household. When St. Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy 3, this is one of the reasons we have an all-male pastorate. Because, you know, St. Paul says, okay, the preacher, the bishop, the presbyter needs to be the husband of one wife, good reputation with outsiders, keeping his own children in submission because if a man doesn't know how to maintain his own household, how's he going to care for the household of God? So the church is a family. And just like in every individual family, so also in the church, um, I often joke that these are communist organizations because this is where communism actually works. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. So within the home, you know, dad goes off to work and goes out and faces the world and, and works hard so that uh, the family can be taken care of. And if you've got a six-month-old infant, right, nobody's mad at the six-month-old infant that they're not pulling their own weight, you know, because the family works by from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Everybody's happy to help the baby. Everybody's happy to see that child grow and, you know, get stronger and smarter and stay healthy and nobody begrudges that. But you do begrudge your children perhaps as they grow up and they become more capable and they, uh, you know, we find the seeds of laziness in them because they're not following the family plan of from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So also within the church, everybody's called to be a son or a daughter. And you know what? If you've got the initial CPA after your name, be really nice if you took a turn being the treasurer. Because in the church, we're a family, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. If you're the kind of guy who knows how to sweat pipe and uh, maybe do a little tuck pointing and put on a roof, if you're that kind of uh, handy guy, it'd be really great if you could be a trustee at church and help us maintain the premises. Because from each according to his ability to each according to his need. 
It's different out in the world where I'm a neighbor, but I'm still called to be a good neighbor. But it would be wrong for me to treat my neighbors as if they were my children. Right now we begin to get into the fact that this idea of neighborliness, this idea of nearness extends all the way through this doctrine of vocation. So if we think of these are spheres of life or the, you know, these circles where I have a call in the church, make that one circle, I have a calling in the home, make that another circle in society. We could put these as concentric circles, like a target. So there I am in the middle. What do I do with myself? Well, first off, God put me in a home. And so the Bible says, he who will not care for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. I have more duties to my wife and children than I do to anybody else. And it would be wrong of me to treat my next door neighbor. Uh, You know, my next door neighbor falls on hard times. I should certainly help him out, but I should not help him out to such a degree that it impedes my ability to care for my own children, to give away all that I have. I have a closer to home duty. And then likewise, St. Paul says, let us do good to all men, but especially to those of the household of faith, that we have a duty of neighborliness to everybody. But Christians really have a duty to other Christians that comes first because we're family. And so once you begin to understand this doctrine of vocation, that you're called by God, that these are holy callings, that you can't quit them, that this is where you're going to find purpose and joy in life, and that these are concentric circles of responsibility. And in fact, that each one of my callings is making a claim on me. It's making a claim on my presence. I have to be there to be a good father. Um, This is why, you know, military deployments are so tough on families. It's really hard to be a husband and wife when you are separated for weeks, months at a time. Really difficult. How are you actually going to be a neighbor to the people that God has put within your life if you don't even know the names of your next door neighbors? If you live in some, you know, anonymous housing development and you, you never take the time to get to know everybody. If you just go about your daily life and maybe you go to the same coffee shop every day, but you never take the time to learn the name of the cashier, the owner of the shop, the, you know, know the people where you work, et cetera. So we're called to interact with the people that God places near to us in each of those spheres, home, church, and world. And now we can begin to evaluate What are the weights of these responsibilities? I've I've got to be there. My my presence is required. And also my support in general is required. And I already mentioned that obviously I've got, I owe a lot more of myself, my time and my resources, everything that makes up me. I owe more of that at home than I owe anywhere else. But it's not as though I can ignore the world, ignore my duties as a neighbor, as a citizen, as a co-worker. That also has a claim on me. And likewise, you know, there's a claim on me at church to my fellow Christians in my local congregation and then beyond the congregation as well. And understanding those concentric circles of vocation can begin to really help me sort this out especially when it comes to financial obligations. Because when it comes down to, you know, the stewardship question, again, I don't think it pays us to beat around the bush. People want to know, Christians want to know, well, how much am I supposed to give to church? And one thing we can say to them is, well, not too much, right? Because it would be wrong. I have a closer to home duty. Think of Mark chapter 10. Jesus is going about his ministry. The rich young ruler comes up, you know, Lord Jesus, what should I do to be saved? Well, you've, you've read the law. What do you think? Well, and he just lists the Ten Commandments, right? On your father, your mother, you know, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. And Jesus says, there you go. Do that and you will live. 
But the man seeking to justify himself said, well, you know, I've done all those. And again, we shouldn't be too harsh on the guy, right? The text says that Jesus loved the guy. Uh, His heart was in the right place. He wasn't thinking that he had kept the Ten Commandments perfectly. He was just saying, well, you know, I haven't actually committed adultery. I haven't actually killed anybody. I'm not a thief. Is that really all there is to it? Just being a decent person that doesn't feel right. And so his feeling was correct. Just being a decent person is not enough to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, all right, you lack one thing. Go sell your possessions, give them to the poor and come follow me. Now, asking people today, asking our parishioners today, that commandment that Jesus gave that guy, is that for you and me? Is that how stewardship works for us? Uh, Because there are a lot of commandments in the Bible that are for you. You know, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't murder. But there are also commandments in the Bible that have not been given to you. So, for example, God called Joshua and the Israelites to go into Canaan and wage war. Right? God has not called you to get on a boat and go over to Canaan and kill every man, woman, and child. That's not your calling. So this commandment from Jesus, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. Is that a commandment for you or not? Clearly not. But why? Explain why. And people will often want to spiritualize this. They'll say, well, Jesus doesn't literally want me to do that. He just wants me to be ready to do that. I'm like, well, okay, but that's not what I asked. Is this command, does he want you to do this? Well, everybody can kind of feel that, no, I don't think God wants me to give all that I have to the poor and go follow him. But interestingly enough, back to what goes wrong when you get sanctification wrong, there is an an entire group of people who think that's exactly what you should do to live your very best life. Uh, Still today in the Roman Catholic Church, if you want to live the best Christian life, you're told that you should consider whether or not you want to be a religious, which is you know, the, the official term for being a monk or a nun, and take your vow of poverty. Give away all that you have and go live in the monastery, and that's a better way to live. And uh, we say, uh, no, that's running away from the callings that God has given you in your home, in your church, and in society. That's a, that's a self-chosen calling. You know, Lutherans become the greatest enemies of the whole monastic system precisely because they see it as running away from the callings that God has given us. So back to the rich young ruler, you know, what would happen if you gave away all that you have? So Pastor Smith, what would happen to you and your family if you gave away all that you had and just went to follow Jesus? Well, then my children would be homeless and poor and well, my wife as well, right? There you go. And what happens to all the employees for the small business owner? He liquidates the business and says, I'm giving this check to church. I'm going to follow the Lord, right? I mean, it all falls apart because it would actually be contrary to your vocation to do that. So how much should you give to church? Well, not so much that it bankrupts your family. I'm not calling you for that. I'm not calling you to do anything that's impossible. Um, How much should you give to charity to your neighbors? Likewise. Uh, You should be generous, you should be kind, you should be loving, but I mean, it shouldn't prevent you from making sure that your children can have the kind of education that's going to allow them to be productive members of society. You shouldn't not send your kids to Lutheran school because you're spending the tuition money on your neighbor who had a tragedy in his life. You're not called to do that. And so people in the church want to know, and it's, a, I think, a godly impulse to just want to know, well, What does the Bible say? What should I be giving at church? And we kind of did this in the first segment. I walked through, well, if you look at financial support of full-time ministry in the Old Testament, God said that took a tithe for that to be done appropriately. And it's hard for me to imagine that when the apostles talk about being generous in the New Testament, it's hard to me imagine that the church is going to be able to effectively perform her ministry if we refuse even to do what they did in the Old Testament, when the New Testament church's job is so much bigger. So I I really do challenge people to think about that spirit of the law in the Old Testament and to compare what they're giving. Because St. Paul says this very clearly to Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says, on the first day of the week, 
each one of you should set aside a proportion as God has prospered you, a proportion of your income. So again, it's hard for me to imagine that St. Paul would say, well, two or 3%, I guess that's fine. Hard for me to imagine him that he would say that when Jesus had said, you know, you Pharisees tithe on your mint and cumin and well, you should without neglecting the weightier matters of the law. So I think that people, Christians need to hear that message and learn to think about this through their vocation, that God has called you to do this. And we could take it from here in a bunch of different directions with our last few minutes, but, um, you know, questions about tithing, about generosity, about a full-time ministry, but specifically for your show, I want to bring it back now to where do we find this in the confessions? And it's very interesting. We do something, something that I think is a real tragedy. We abuse our most used Lutheran confession. Well, perhaps besides the creeds, but besides, if you want to count the creeds as a section of the confessions, you know, we use the small catechism day in and day out. And we do this thing to ourselves that's a, a real abuse to the catechism. We, we have this phrase, the six chief parts. And uh, so, Pastor Smith, what are the six chief parts of the catechism? Well, you have the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, Lord's Supper, and Confession and Absolution. There you go. The and six, I m- the six, messed up that order there. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. The six chief parts. Well, if something is not a chief part, I guess it's a not chief part, a lesser part, and not as important part. And yet there are three more parts to the catechism, right? There's also daily prayers. So in the catechism, you learn a whole lot about prayer. You learn the Lord's prayer and what it means, but then you need to get to the next part after the chief parts where Luther actually tells you, now here's how you ought to pray. At a minimum, you ought to pray when you wake up, at every meal, and when you go to bed. And here's how you can do it. There's also Christian questions and their answers, which is about preparing yourself to take communion. So in the small catechism, you learn about communion in the sixth chief part, but it's actually in the back of the catechism, Christian questions and their answers, where you actually learn how to do it, how to get yourself ready to go take communion you know, examine yourself with these questions. And then likewise, the table of duties, a list of a whole bunch of Bible verses about how to actually live as a Christian. The six chief parts taught me about baptism, taught me that I'm supposed to, you know, every day through contrition and repentance, drown the old Adam and a new man is supposed to arise. But how am I supposed to do that? Well, through your vocations, which are listed for you in the table of duties. So I am 110% against the phrase, the six chief parts, just be the nine parts of the catechism. Because then what often happens in congregational teaching is that pastors and confirmands, you know, man, we're hustling to get the six chief parts memorized and taught from September through May. And so, well, if we got to cut something, well, I guess we'll just cut the things we don't call chief parts. And so I think our catechumens have, and frankly, our pastors have much less familiarity with the table of duties than they do with the six chief parts. And that's a pity because the table of duties is actually about putting rubber to the road, about actually putting the catechism into practice. And sure enough, it's in the table of duties that the stewardship verses from the Bible show up. So in there, it says one of the vocations that Luther goes through is the vocation of Christian, the vocation of son or daughter in the kingdom of God. And the question he has there is, what do the hearers owe their pastor? And that's where you find, you know, 1 Corinthians 9, the Lord has ordained that those who preach the gospel should make their living from the gospel. And, you know, be not fooled, God is not mocked, a man reaps what he sows. The one who receives the teaching must share all good things with the man who teaches. So when, you know, back to the beginning, when I talked about how people are so uncomfortable with stewardship, I find it very ironic that when they say that, what they're saying is 
I'm uncomfortable teaching the small catechism because there's the stewardship Bible verses right in the small catechism. The answer to this question of how do I approach stewardship is right there in the simplest of our confessions, what we're supposed to use to teach children and catechumens and people who are new to the faith, but that each of us will never outgrow right there in the small catechism. That's how we should think about finances in the church. Uh, we shouldn't think about them as finances in the church, as paying the bills. We should think of them as one of my God-given duties through one of my God-given vocations. And as every part of the law, this has been given for my blessing. And it's a pity that we neglect stewardship because we miss this fact. And if we ever neglect sanctification at all, we miss this fact that the law is given to bless us. And that when we as the teachers and preachers in the church refuse or soft pedal sanctification and the encouragement, the exhortation that the people of God deserve to hear, we also neglect to remind them, God has given you these commandments to bless you. And actually you'll be missing out on a blessing if you miss out on walking in the ways of these commandments, just like you're missing out on the blessing of a happy matrimony if you break the sixth commandment. You know, so, so if you indulge in pornography, you're hurting yourself. Your breaking of the sixth commandment is robbing you of a blessing. If you are a dishonest person who gossips and talks about people behind their back, if you're the kind of person who enjoys to you know, spreading a juicy tail and maybe even enjoys just kind of twisting the knife in somebody's back, you're missing out on a blessing. You don't know what it's like to be the kind of person that people trust, that people respect, that people will share sensitive information with, and they see you as someone that they can trust. You're missing a blessing if you break the eighth commandment. Well, likewise, you're missing a blessing if you are not living a godly life of generous stewardship, if you're not following God's commandment, perhaps, I mean, most of all, corporately, if we refuse to keep this commandment, we're not going to have the kind of quality ministry that we want in the church. But likewise, you, you know, another blessing that faithful stewardship gives is it teaches you responsibility. It teaches you to live responsibly through your vocations. Um, I don't know who first came up with this line, but it's a good one when you start to talk about tithing and people have questions about it and, man, I don't know how you could do that. It's a good line. If you can't live on 90% of your income, you can't live on 100% of your income. So one of the blessings that God gives by telling us to set aside a proportion of what he gives us each week is he's teaching us to think about this, to be responsible and godly, to plan to not be profligate and prodigal. Likewise, God is teaching us contentment, that we don't need to hold on and to grasp every farthing that comes through our hands. He's teaching us to be like him when he teaches us to give and be generous and be kind. So we could talk about this for another hour and another hour, but stewardship belongs within the doctrine of sanctification. It's part of the law. The law of God is good and wise. Christians should be taught this. And furthermore, if you're going to teach sanctification effectively, you teach it through the vocations that God has given each one of us. And the people need to hear that God wants to bless us through those vocations and the roles and duties that he's given to us. And when we miss out, when we neglect those roles and duties, we're hurting the people that God has given us to care for as well as ourselves. With just a couple more minutes here, Pastor Curtis, as we've done these various topical Concord Matter shows, if you will, we've continued to make the point that everything that the church does, everything that the church does, is on the basis of her confession of faith, mm -hmm. living out the Christian life. And you've been laying that out for us really well. Uh, just give us a little bit of summary here for us. Why does Concord Matter for stewardship? God has called you to be his holy child. And 
stewardship can be a great window because it is so unignorable in the church. It can be a great window to force us to think about how we're called to be the holy children of God and to put our confession, which is laid out so clearly, especially in the Augsburg Confession, of that distinction between justification and sanctification, that they're distinct yet connected, that they're two sides of the same coin, that we have to understand how they flow together. Another blessing that God has given us by forcing us to live together, by forcing the fact that those who preach the gospel should make their living from the gospel, it forces us to confront this issue. It forces us to consider the difference between greed and covetousness on the one hand and generosity and open-handedness and godliness on the other. And this will always keep before us the need to talk about who we are as the holy children of God. And so it's a great opportunity, a stewardship crisis in a church, a financial difficulty in the church is a great opportunity to seize our confession of faith, to teach it clearly, to delineate properly between justification and sanctification and teach that godly sanctification that we see in the New Testament exhibited by the apostles and their teaching and that we challenge the people to live that godly life that God has called them to do as a response to the gospel message of salvation in Christ. That is Pastor Heath Curtis. He is pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Worden, Illinois, and Zion Lutheran Church in Carpenter, Illinois. He also serves as coordinator for stewardship for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and he's also co-author of the book, Stewardship for the Care of Souls. Thank you so much, Pastor Curtis, for joining us today and talking about why Concord matters for stewardship. Thank you, Sean. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church.